Greetings and salutations and welcome to the Path of Exile Open Beta Weekend. Path of Exile is a hack and slash MMORPG coming out of Grinding Gear Games, and over the last five or so hours I've been playing this game fairly heavily, and I thought I'd give you guys a look at exactly how it compares to other games in the hack and slash genre. And so, this is my comprehensive look at Path of Exile. Character creation is fairly standard for the genre. There are five classes to choose from, the Templar, Marauder, Ranger, Duelist, and Witch, and each has their own sort of spin on, on gameplay. Each has a desired outcome, the Ranger, of course, wanting to be as much ranged DPS and avoiding combat all, at all times, whereas the Marauder is more into I'm going to survive any hit you throw at me, and I'm going to hit you back really, really hard in melee. And then, of course, you can go for the Witch and just throw bursts of arcane power at the enemy and hope that that stops them getting back up, which it usually does. Not particularly innovative, but why fix what ain't broke? This class system has worked through Diablo 2, Diablo 1, Torchlight. It's... There's, there's no real need to change what's there. The stat system, however, is where you start to branch off from what you would normally see in a hack and slash game. They've gone for a truly massive stat grid, essentially. Similar to what you would see in the sphere grid of Final Fantasy X. You take paths and constantly increase your character in passive ways, increasing your damage output, increasing your movement speed, increasing your fighting speed, or giving you just that little bit more oomph behind your spells. It gives you plenty of room to customize your character, there's almost infinite choices you can go, and you can shift. The, the skill grid isn't unique for each class, they're all just different starting points for each class. So, I could take a duelist and shift into where the witch focuses on and become a casting duelist. And whilst you wouldn't be as good as the witch, because the witch started there, you could potentially become almost as dangerous at magic as the witch is, and you can still pick up the skill same skills due to the interesting way they work that in which is what I'll be covering next. The skill system is very, very unique. I don't know a single other game that does it quite this way. Skills are found as item drops, they're gems, and they're equipped. A almost any item you find will have sockets in it, and those sockets are color-coded for the type of gem, and then you put the gem in the item, all of a sudden you know that skill but you only know that skill as long as you've got that item equipped. You can, however, take gems out and shift them round, so you never have to lo lose a skill gem, and as you level up, so do your skill gems, granting you, well, a constant growth in power, provided you can keep your gems equipped, and it becomes an interesting balance of, okay, I want better items, but the items that I want to improve into don't have the same gem slots, and so I can't carry all my skills anymore. It can be a problem, but it can also have you trying out different skill combinations, and keeps the game constantly changing around you as you balance whether you want to improve your items, or whether you want to just keep going with the skill set that you've got. Another aspect of the skill system is the support gem, which is another type of gem which only increases the stats of a skill. I picked up a gem which increased my accuracy rating by 60 points, and so I equipped it in an item. But it very clearly says, this only affects the skills that are also in that item. So I made sure it was in an item which was granting me basic attack improvement skills, so that it wasn't its effect wasn't wasted. Which adds another little balance to what type of sockets do you want in which item? And it's really a well-developed, and whilst it may sound odd now, I can guarantee once you start playing it, it is a very, very well thought out and developed system. 
Speaking of well thought out and developed systems, the item trading in this game is very different to what you'd see in any other hack and slash. Instead of trading an item for money, this game has opted to remove the concept of currency and you trade items for the single use items that you use to improve your equipment or identify your equipment. The scroll of wisdom is the equivalent of a copper. It's it's very very low end currency, but at the same time it's one of the more useful items because almost everything you find is going to be unidentified. So you have yet another balancing act which sounds odd when I say it, but I can guarantee to you if you play this game you'll find that you'll probably really enjoy the concept of trading items for items and it fits the law quite well because everyone else on the island with you is exiled. Why would do they want currency when money isn't going to help you live? And so that's a really really well thought out system and it's really really well balanced. It kind of promotes you to pick up as much loot as you can and sell it all because then you'll have a lot of stuff to use and customize your equipment and make sure your equipment is exactly where you want it to be and even if it isn't where you want it to be you can use those same items instead of customizing your equipment to improve on them. Now the potion system is something that I really really love. It's a unique and different look on how you can get potions to work. Instead of finding potions and, you know, picking them up, using them, burning through them constantly, you pick up flasks which never actually run out. They just hold X quantity of charges, and as you drink them, the charges go down, you can eventually empty the flask. But emptying the flask isn't an issue because you just refill it constantly. The flask is refilled by the act of you killing monsters, so as you fight through the hordes you get access to more life in your potions, which then gives you access to, well, killing more things to get you more stuff for your potions. The other thing of the flasks is that they can actually be magically affected, so I found flasks which didn't heal me as much as the flask one tier level below them. They were actually worse off, um, but as a compensation it actually gave you 50% of that health instantaneously and the other 50% was restored at about 130% the original rate. It Potions don't heal you instantly, they heal you over time and so this potion was yeah, I'm not going to heal you over time, I'm instead going to heal you almost instantly. So it was kind of my get out of jail free potion. Whereas I had other potions which increased my resistances to attacks, or my evasion chance, so I would use those at the start of a fight, because they would heal me slowly throughout the fight, and while they were healing me slowly, I also was a little bit more tankier. So, it's, it's really bizarre to think about it that no one's thought of doing something like this with potions before, but in the end, it gives you a whole different set of items to look at improving and getting the best quality of so that you got the right potions for your character. So as I said, I love this system. It is amazing and it's, it's just so, so very unique and I think it works really, really well. It's very well implemented. Now, the combat system is nothing special. You click to attack, you use a variety of other buttons to use abilities. It's exactly what we saw in Diablo 2. A little bit more streamlined, the abilities are very easy to use when they're assigned to buttons that aren't right mouse button. And you can have about seven abilities equipped in total, five on QWERT, and then three over your mouse buttons. There's nothing more to it than that. You click enemies, enemies die. It may sound boring and repetitive, but that's what you're getting into when you're playing a hack and slash game. It's exactly what it says on the label. It is a hack and slash. It plays like a hack and slash. The combat, why fix what ain't broke yet again? My conclusion can be brought down to two very simple points. The first is that this game is free to play. 
and at a little bit under 4 gigabytes in size, you can download it. I mean, it took me all day, but my internet here is terrible, so I imagine you guys will have it downloaded in half an hour, maybe a full hour if your internet's running slow. It's it's just accessible. You can go straight into it. Not yet, because it's still in closed beta, but once the beta opens up in a month or so, anyone can just get in and take a look, and it costs you nothing to do so, so I thoroughly recommend it for that reason. If you're not really a fan of the genre, you can try this one out and see if it'll change your opinions, and if you are a fan of the genre, just go straight into it. It's, it's a hack and slash game through and through with some very unique innovations. The other main point I'd like to look at is that it's it's inspired by Diablo 2 to the point where people have claimed that it's more Diablo 3 than Diablo 3 will be. And so it can be a huge nostalgia trip, but at the same time has enough in it that it stands up on its own accord without that nostalgia being there. If I hadn't played a hack and slash game before and wasn't in love with the series, well, I'd probably still have really enjoyed it. It's it is a well-made game, and everything about it screams, play this, its value for money is infinite. Like I said, it costs nothing, so why not? I thoroughly recommend to anyone to just make an account, see if you can get into the closed beta, and if you can't, wait for the open. It'll be really, really good fun, and I will most definitely be playing it.